Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I'm uh, honored, and it's a big pleasure to be here and discuss in this um, uh, frame some concrete examples about um, cardiovas in cardiovascular research about how to apply in diagnostics and therapeutics, potential therapeutics, new digital health options. As you all know, if we want to achieve and enter modern medicine, we have to take into account different aspects. Very important if we speak of big data, digital applications and so on, is the quality of clinical data we deal with. So cohorts, phenotyping, clinical outcome has to be defined in very high quality. If not, all digital approaches, all artificial intelligence approaches are useless if you don't have high quality clinical data. Second, you also need high quality biobanks with standard operating procedures according to DNA, RNA and all other issues you want to link with the clinical data. Third, you need high quality imaging data because at the very end you link molecular data, imaging data and clinical data. And what is all about the modern artificial intelligence theories if we don't have an accurate basis to deal with? Certainly, we are living in the post-omics area. We are living now in sequencing and other areas. So this has to be integrated. It's a huge challenge of data protection. And finally, we should not forget to link all the clinical data and the um, omics data with the classical basics of experimental research. So it's a chain of application integrating clinical science, experimental science, and modern digital opportunities. I want to provide you one example of my favorite one, which is acute coronary syndrome, and how to lead diagnosis and therapy optimization into a new area. I give you, please allow me, three minutes of background because I learned you are not all interventional cardiologists here. So, if you have a myocardial infarction, unfortunately no one has it currently right here. If yes, you have a 75% surviving chance, so no problem. You have MI type 1, and this MI type 1 is nothing else than the plaque which totally or partially occludes the coronary vessel. Forget about all this complicated cardiology stuff, just imagine this here. MI type 2 is an academic one. It's an imbalance between oxygen supply and demand for many reasons. So this is the very simple background. And then you move forward and try to diagnose the acute coronary syndrome. If you feel chest pain, you should nothing else do within a minute to call the emergency doctor and be transferred under protection towards a hospital. And then two issues are of relevance. The EZG and a biomarker test called troponin, which is released directly from the heart. So these are the three key issues, nothing digital so far. Pain, EZG, a little bit digital, and a biomarker with high quality troponin. These three issues need to be combi combined for an accurate diagnosis. 20 years ago now, or 15 to 20 years ago, this new biomarker was discovered and the troponin was classified as being negative and positive. It was like a pregnancy test. And if you have been negative, you have been discharged, positive, you have been kept in hospital and until this troponin turned positive, it took up to 24 hours. Now the technology improved a lot and we can measure the troponin with much more sensitivity.
So everybody of you sitting here have a quantifiable troponin test and no one, as we earlier agreed, has a myocardial infarction. So what to do? These tests had been introduced, you see here, the sensitivity on the left, and these had been the earlier tests. We misclassified uh, a lot of patients with myocardial infarction, and now we can we probably don't miss anyone with these tests, but you have a lot of confusion because no one who has measured this dropping in with a specific value has actually a myocardial infarction. So what to do? And this is the concept that within this thrombus formation, myocardial infarction, the ECG information, we have at zero point at baseline and at one hour, three hours, or six hours follow up, two measurements, and the dynamic range, the rate, the development of troponin over time gives you the percentage of probability of myocardial infarction. What a complication for a cardiologist. It's not positive negative anymore. We have to think. And making think, uh, make this easy, making this easy, we tried to develop and further develop this myocardial infarction strategy. So far, and now digital medicine comes into play and big data and so on and so on. And this is three, four years initiatives now. We have a fraction of rule out and they should survive many, many years. We have a fraction of rule in and they should be treated accordingly with medication and invasive procedures but only those who really benefit from this treatment. So we need to have a very precise information. So big data comes into play. We, for three, four years, harmonized from different countries in Europe, Australia, and the US, all the available data. And it took us ages to overcome the data protection issues, to overcome the US, Europe border, and so on and so on, with Australia was much easier. And at least we gathered a database which, con which gave, provided us the advantage to develop a new concept. And the new concept is moving medical diagnostics into risk probabilities of disease. So if your hospital in Valencia define a negative predictive value between 99.5% and 100% to be very safe for discharge. No mortality within one year, no myocardial infarction. You need to fulfill these preconditions to reach this negative predictive value. How can we do this? We classify the admission troponin. We classify the second troponin after one hour starting after one hour or even after 45 minutes, we know about the proportion of all patients fulfilling this, and we have information about the outcome at 30 days or one year. And putting all this information together, we end up with a low or intermediate or high risk classification for having myocardial infarction. And this is just an example of a patient who comes in. So finally, this is for, I'll make a long story short, diagnosis of myocardial infarction. So finally, we put online a tool 12 weeks ago, after simultaneously to publication in the New England Journal of Medicine with which we developed two years this change, this paradigm change in myocardial infarction diagnostics, where doctors have the option to, full, to fill in all these values and finally end up with the precision of the diagnosis and make their medical decision based on this diagnostic precision. This is not a very handleable tool because you have to do it with only two to three variables and it's online at a home page. So the next step of development is as follows. We include currently, based on this worldwide largest data set, the most predictive variables. It's not artificial intelligence, it's only intelligence and it's a little bit artificial. 
I can explain it in more depth later on, if you like. 14 predictors, and they reach, after multiple learning steps, towards a very high precision in derivation and validation approaches of myocardial infarction. And we develop this within the European project. We validate this globally. We validate this by imaging if those concepts are visible in necrosis of, my, uh, of MRI. And then we are currently about developing an app which integrates all this data and comes up with, this is a tool, comes up with the probability of risk. And what is the breakthrough? The breakthrough is that you can do this out of hospital. The prerequisite is that the high sensitive nature of the test is now available on a technical point of care platform from January 2020. It's a Scottish company, excellent, went from January 2020. For the first time, we can, the ambulatory doctor and all these patients get out of the hospital but never come in the hospital, have a blood test. They have a second blood test after 45 minutes. They enter all the easily available variables like age, sex, easy G information, which is, can be digitally transformed, and then end up within finally seeing 45 to 50 minutes in a very accurate precision of diagnosis or rule out. And from this, you can take the 70 to 80% fraction of those patients who will be immediately or after one day discharged from the overcrowded emergency rooms, you would not ever enter them into the hospital. So this is a breakthrough in my, I hope, in myocardial infarction Diagnosis, integrating digital tools, EZG, taking advantage of a new high sensitivity laboratory approach and of the calculation of the 14 variables which can be easily within seconds put in in the newly developed app. So I have still five minutes, thank you. And I give you a second example. This was a disease cohort. Now we are going to the population we harmonized population-based data around the world. So this was based on three European projects, starting 1998. Now it's a fourth European project within Horizon 2020. And this is a harmonization of all, mostly all available population-based cohorts in Europe. And we, again, took the big effort to integrate US, which is really difficult and Australia, and now Asia and African cohorts to come up with a global cardiovascular risk consortium. So far, 36 cohorts, nearly 20 countries, and only three continents so far, but we are working on the progress. But to make a long story short also here, we want to, in particular for Asia and Africa, make it very clear that the modifiable risk factors which we are currently having for developing cardiovascular disease, such as smoking, lipid values, diabetes, and um, hypertension. If they are modified, we can save a, a substantial fraction of cardiovascular events in worldwide, in particular in Europe, because there we have the highest percentage of modifiable cardiovascular risk factors. Taking advantage of such an approach, similar to the app we are about developing in acute coronary syndrome, we develop um, currently um, a population-based risk app. And this is the first step and provides the following example. You all know your blood cholesterol level. Who knows his or her blood cholesterol level? Oh. 4%, we still need to work on this. So, then you enter your age in your age group. It's not a problem. I'm sure you know your age. Then, number of further cardiovascular risk factors. And then you have the probability for non-fatal or fatal cardiovascular disease at the age of 75. And the therapy consequence out of it is that you can substantially decrease your personal risk 
If you have a 19% personal risk for 75 years of age suffering from myocardial infarction or cardiovascular death even, if you decrease your lipid concentration by 50% by physical activity, but this won't be enough, maybe by a medication, you, have, you can calculate your personal risk decrease. So as an example, we took the first author of this big paper, which is now probably coming out in Lancet, a healthy young man with slightly elevated cholesterol of 155 non-HDL. So that's average. Everybody of you have something like this, a little bit more, a little bit less. Below 45 years of age, no further cardiovascular risk factors. And he, so far, has a European score of nearly zero. But the European score suffers as many European scores from the invalidity of only being available or relevant for five or 10 years. This is the first time the not lifetime risk, but very long risk. And he has, despite being very healthy and not smoking, and he has a 19% of risk suffering some sort of cardiovascular event at the age of 75 and could reduce it to 12% by decreasing lipid levels. So that's another application um, on a European level we are currently working on. And finally, to make a long story very short, I skip this here. In blue you see the burden of cardiovascular disease and death and in particular um, in Europe and the Western world it is improving. In red you see the areas uh, worldwide, in particular in Eastern Europe and also Russia, where we have a very high burden of cardiovascular disease. And also here I want to focus the attention, this is a pan-European approach again. You have 62 to 65% uh, of explanation for cardiovascular disease development. There's a huge remaining space, about 35-40% of unexplained, unexplained cardiovascular disease. And this is something we target, and I'm sorry I skipped this uh, more or less, with the Hamburg City Health Study. It's a unique enterprise of a huge fraction of Hamburg citizens, the second largest city in Germany, um, between 45 and 75 years of age, and we gather all information. We worked three years on data protection, and the data practitioner in Hamburg is, a, is a, a most efficient in Germany, if not to say the worst. But anyhow, we solved this after three years and have included all medical examinations. You can, by imaging, ultrasound, and so on, molecular examination. We did a 15 million program and total genome sequencing now and have all the information to explain this fraction, say 35%, which is remaining to understand or to close the gap of our understanding of cardiovascular disease here with the sophisticated biobank and so on and so on. So it's a huge effort we are currently undertaking and I close with this vision. Take heart failure, and I took this because I learned uh, that it is one of your specific uh, topics here. And this heart failure topic, we tackle as follows. Let's say we have 45 citizens from Hamburg. And then at the very end, after six years of these 45,000, 680 will develop heart failure. <coughs> of those 680, we have imaging of MRI, ultrasound, total genome sequencing, and all the clinical and ECG variables. And we are now on a three years or four years course. And within the next three years, we will combine all the millions of variables to those individuals who developed heart failure and who had been apparently healthy up front. And we try to understand, and this is true artificial intelligence then, with our department of bioinformatics, which of the one million variables we integrate in this approach will explain at the very end um, the development of the course of heart failure. And this closes also to the circle to that what I mentioned very early, because this is the absolute prerequisite to apply bioinformatics and artificial intelligence. The absolute prerequisite is very, very perfect data 
because then you will obtain um, reliable results. And this is an approach for many, many years now, six, seven years, to achieve in the city of Hamburg this clean data. And I'm very grateful to the governor of Hamburg and to uh, the, um, the uh, government uh, that they supply this because this takes us in a position, brings us in a position to really apply the modern technology. It's also for stroke and many other diseases, but that's uh, uh, one of the key issues we are currently performing in Hamburg. So I hope I gave you an impression of one acute coronary syndrome example, one population-based disease example, and one general thinking, and I'm very happy to discuss further. Thank you very much.